Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Red Gaming Tech.com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up for the past 24 or so hours. And we're going to start things out with several pieces of AMD news, the first of which is a leaked benchmark of the Rome-based 7452 processor, which is a 32-core, 64-thread CPU. And the results of this processor are extremely impressive. So it has around a 17% uh, increase in clock frequency over its predecessor. But the biggest uh, talking and discussion point here is, without a question, the performance results. So we actually have them originating from Foranix.com. However, uh, many of these entries have since been nuked. So they have now uh, been archived on computerbase.de. DE, excuse me, and they have done a really nice job of uh, putting them into bars and graphs. So I will be reading them from computerbase.de, but I will link both uh, sources in the description of this video. So that we're very clear, the um, Rome CPU 7452 is 32-core, 64-thread, and it is in a dual-socket configuration, and it comes with a base frequency of 2.35 gigahertz. The same configuration could be said as well for 7551, which is an epic uh, Naples architecture-based CPU. 32 cores, 64 threads, but the base frequency of this CPU is 2 gigahertz. Of course, that's well established as this is a released product. And we also have, for a comparison, an Intel Xeon Gold. It is a model number of 6148, and it too is in a dual socket configuration. So we'll start things with um, the geometric mean of all the benchmarks and the Rome CPU scores 99. The Naples processor scores just 69 points and finally the Xeon Gold scores 50 points. Other results uh, as we drill down such as John the Ripper uh, with the Blowfish uh, benchmark which is running at 78,000 on the 7452 as its score. And meanwhile, um, the Intel Xeon processors score just 53,000. So clearly a massive win there for AMD. We also have similar results for John the Ripper with the traditional DES uh, testing. The PHP compilation time, which is time to compile, this is in seconds, Intel score much more favorably with uh, 39.83 versus 40.45 of uh, Rome. I'm not going to go through all of the benchmarks because, well, you can just see them on screen and I'll also, once again, link to the website in question as well. But we have a couple of small cliff notes before we finish the story. The first of which is, of course, there are also higher uh, SKUs for Rome. We know that there's a 64 core, 128 thread monstrosity. And also, uh, Intel have a plethora of other processes as well. So, this is not by all means a comprehensive picture of what we have for the next generation server. Uh, outlook for both companies, but at least it gives us some indicator of exactly what AMD have managed to achieve with Rome. Next up, we have a leaked benchmark of the Ryzen 3800X. The only caveat with this benchmark is it is using rather slow memory, running at just 2133 MHz, which obviously is a kick in the shin to not only single-threaded performance of Geekbench, but also multi-threading performance. But nevertheless, it's a fascinating insight into the runnings of the processor. Let's have a quick look. It goes without saying that the specifications we can basically sing by now, especially when it comes to cache sizes and so on, we have uh, level one and level, uh, sorry, level one instruction, level one data caches, both registering at 32 kilobytes times eight, obviously for each of the cores, 512 kilobytes of level two cache, and finally the level three cache is 16 megabytes times two. When it comes to the performance though, uh, we have a single core score of 54, sorry, 5,406 with a multi-core score of 34,059. This is with a maximum frequency of 4.47 gigahertz and the base frequency hitting just 3.9 gigahertz. 
But if we compare that to the results that we've already seen for the 3600, the Ryzen 5 3600, uh, the one with the faster memory that we've seen, we have a multi-core score of 29,000. The Ryzen 5 3600 with single core performance scores 5,599, so that's called 5,600 points, whereas the 3800X here is scoring just 5,400 points. Clearly, obviously, most of this is down to things such as memory timings and clock frequencies as well. And now we're going to move over to a hybrid piece of news between the next generation consoles and also AMD themselves. So this story begins with the PlayStation 5, because according to Colin Moriarty, who is a former IGN editor, the PlayStation 5, from what he's heard from developers, is actually more powerful than the next generation Xbox. We're going to get into how this ties into AMD in just a moment, I promise. And I'm trying to set the foundation here. But this is actually contrary to what others have been saying as well, because we've also had other developers who have been telling us that the next generation Xbox, particularly the higher end model, is going to be more powerful than the PlayStation 5. Indeed, Albert Pinello has whispered that from what he knows, and obviously he's no longer an employee at Microsoft, so he's hearing it through the grapevine, that... From his understanding, the PlayStation 5 development kit is actually further along than the Xbox development kit. And it's actually really interesting because uh, Jason Schreier from Kutaka recently commented on Twitter that, to his knowledge, neither console's specification has actually been locked down yet. In other words, the CPU performance, the GPU performance, and so on can change up until the system's released. And frankly, I agree with that. I mean, there's a couple of stories from the previous generation that really highlight this. The first is the PlayStation 4. You may recall that early leaks of the system were telling us that it had 4 gigabytes of GDDR5 memory. And what does the system actually really have? It's 8 gigabytes. Now, that's not because the early leaks were wrong. It's because that Sony, close to last minute, decided to double the amount of RAM in the console, which was really fortunate. I mean, I think it would have really... Uh, been a uh, arrow in the knee if they'd have only had four gigabytes of memory for the PS4. And obviously the Xbox also went through some changes as well. Both the CPU as well as the GPU saw significant clock frequency increases. The CPU, I believe the original frequency was the same as the PS4, 1.6 gigahertz, and it went up to 1.75 gigahertz, which was really beneficial to them on tasks that leverage the CPU, of course. And then we also saw some other changes as well with the development kit with both consoles, where it uh, allowed the developers to start um, pulling performance from the 7th CPU core. I went really in-depth into the analysis of all of this stuff back in the day, by the way. Although that's not technically a change to the actual architecture itself, but it is a change to how the console functions, I suppose, from the perspective of a developer. And we also saw from uh, Microsoft an increase in the GPU clock frequency. They originally targeted the same 800 megahertz for its uh, APU, uh, sorry, for its GPU as the PlayStation 4, but uh, Microsoft increased it to 853 megahertz for the Xbox One based system, uh, which had a twofold benefit. The first, obviously, is it increased the uh, performance of the GPU itself, but it also increased the bandwidth of the ES RAM, which was uh, very critical to the console's performance. It was 32 megabytes of ES RAM combined with uh, DDR3 memory on the system. So now we start moving into how this actually brings AMD into the equation and also some mysteries. Unfortunately, we don't know the answer to some of these questions. So these are going to be things that we're only going to learn the answer to in the future. But there have been a couple of very interesting uh, Navi IDs that have popped up. And also, these have been correlated with PCI uh, IDs as well from Kimichi on Twitter. Uh, I'll give him a shout out as well and link to him in the description of this video. So let's take a look. So on freedesktop.org, there are several Nave device IDs, and these range from Nave 10, which we all know and love, all the way to uh, Nave 12 and Nave 21. Some of these are also with the light uh, prefix as well. 
Now, what makes these super duper interesting is because if we were to take a look at the uh, PCI D slash driver ID, one of the Nave 10 lights has a graphics ID of GFX uh, 1000 and also GFX 1001. It's also interesting because we have the ID name of Arial, but because there are two IDs, um, we've seen this from other uh, graphics cards in the past from AMD, but the second ID could also mean there is the presence of a high bandwidth cache controller, which first saw the rounds, of course, back in the days of Vega. Now, pure guess time, because obviously AMD are not telling me what any of this stuff means, to be honest. Uh, but Nave 12 is probably the lower end SKUs that we currently, based on the architecture we currently have, and then Nave 14 are probably GPUs, which are the entry level models. Given AMD have chosen to go with RX 5700 and 5700 XT, for the sake of this video, I think the most logical naming scheme to continue down the stack with would be the 5600 series and also the 5500 series. Goodness knows if we're also going to see like an XT and a uh, vanilla variant of those as well. It may make some sense because after all that helps them uh, if we have some dies that don't quite make uh, the XT performance levels. And then we also have Nav A21. I'm really avoiding the light stuff for a moment because that's a whole question in and of itself. Uh, so for Nav A21, it's possible these are either the higher end SKUs, which may launch next year. After, after all, we've heard that those are going to be based on RDNA 2 and possibly with ray tracing, or it's something entirely different, maybe like a prosumer variant of the card that maybe have additional functionality, maybe it's got additional memory. My source did tell me back in the day, actually it's the same source that told me the next, uh, the second iteration of RDNA would have, well, back then of course it was just known as the Navi architecture, would have ray tracing, but that source did tell me that there would be prosumer variants and also cards which would be for the data center as well. So possibly this is related to Lowe's or maybe it is based in an entirely different architecture. We don't really know yet, unfortunately. As for light, well, that's where things get a little tricky because Arial is definitely a code name for the PS5, so it's possible that at least one of these IDs is for the PS5. We did see the Gonzalo APU as well, of course, uh, which was tweeted out by Tim Apisak, and we have seen a couple of variants of that, with one having a significantly higher graphics core, and there have been some rumours that from um, has been floating around the internet that some of the PS5 development kits have had HBCC, uh, but ultimately we are left with a lot more questions uh, now we've found this stuff than what we actually have answers for, which is kind of frustrating but also somewhat fun. So I imagine that we will get a lot more answers as the months continue to roll by. And Phil Spencer himself has said that they haven't really actually finalized all of the details of the system. Uh, that is the next generation Xbox. And indeed, it's even more puzzling with the Xbox because we know that there are two different SKUs planned. There's the Anaconda and there's Lockhart, with Lockhart being the lower end model. That's if they are still doing that, I'm probably guessing they are. So it also makes it trickier because then you also have to start wondering, well, what's the shape of the development kit and what development kit are developers actually getting their hands on? So for example, is it a halfway house between the two systems or is it closer to Anaconda or is it closer to Lockhart? No one really knows for certain. And that's going to be the state of affairs, I imagine, for some time. Phil Spencer has also said that they don't actually know what the prices of the system yet. They're still trying to figure that out. And obviously price is really what is going to be the limiting factor of a console as well. If you're charging more money, you can squeeze more hardware into the system. And we know some very ambiguous statements right now from Microsoft that said that they've got 40 times the uh, drive performance compared to the previous generation, which doesn't really mean much. It's most likely going to be some type of SSD based on the PCIe 4 interface, which is pretty much to match what Sony have said. Basically, all Microsoft have told us verbally or with visuals at E3 is stuff that matches what Sony have said for the PlayStation 5. So at the moment, it's very much a game of poker with neither side wanting to reveal 
all of their cards, which just makes sense given that the systems are still like, let's say, 18-ish months away from launching. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you did, then the normal stuff. Like, share, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Take care. Bye for now.